If you have been joining St. Peter's over the past year, you will know that we've been navigating our way through a long talk series focusing on how each of us is called to be like Jesus. And we've spent the last, I'd say, month or so, maybe a bit longer, exploring if we're all on this journey to become more like Jesus, how can we get other people along for the ride? How can we then go on to teach other people to also be like Jesus? And I don't know whether you've realized, but most of these talks have concluded something along the lines of, we become like Jesus and help others become like Jesus by being transformed by by spending time in the presence of, by, fi- by being filled with the power of Jesus. It's almost like being back at Sunday school. The answer's almost certainly Jesus when you're in church. So, you know, just say Jesus. Um, so if we become like Jesus by spending time with Jesus, the next obvious question is like, how do we spend time with Jesus? How do we remain in his love? How do we actually do that individually and all of us together? But before exploring some more kind of practical things from today's passage that Yaz so beautifully read to us, thanks Yaz, um, let me first give you a little bit of context into this uh, passage of scripture. So just before John 15, we learn that the religious authorities are trying to find and kill Jesus. So as you can expect, his disciples are scared, confused, anxious, not really sure what's going on at this point. Um, Very famously, Mary has just anointed Jesus with oil, which is effectively for his burial. Jesus has washed the disciples' feet and shared supper with them for the last time. And then he shockingly just proclaimed that he will be betrayed and denied. So this teaching isn't to a crowd of thousands, like lots of other teachings. Jesus' very public ministry has actually ended at this point, and he chooses to make two final statements to his closest friends, to his kind of family, before his death. And I'm going to massively paraphrase the whole thing, so do go and read this. Um, But his first statement includes, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus is reassuring his followers When I die, I'm not actually going to leave you. I'm still who I say I am. Be aware of that. Have that in your head. I am still the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And then directly after this comes our passage from John 15. And Jesus says, I'm just going to remind us, I am the true vine. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It has to remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So in this moment, Jesus is revealing not only I am who I say I am. I'm not going to leave you. Remember that. But I'm going to be living inside of you. You're going to be in me. I'm going to remain in you. I'm the vine. You're going to remain in me. You're the branches. And although we know exactly what vines look like, what they do, what they grow, many of us, what their fruits taste like, um, we aren't, it's hard for us to really connect with all of the, the significance of what Jesus is really saying here. Because Although Jesus is using this metaphor to reassure his connection with each of us, which I'll come to, he's also making a monumental statement about who he is. When Jesus says, I am the true vine, his Jewish listeners would have immediately thought of Israel because Old Testament writers described Israel as the vine. And the use of vine imagery was so significant throughout the entire history of Israel that at the entrance of the holy place where God's Shekinah glory, where his presence dwelt in the temple, steps led to the curtain, which was covered in, I've read this, obviously I haven't seen this, but apparently steps led to a curtain which was covered in like blue, purple and red flowers. And then above that was this absolutely gigantic 
pure gold grapevine. And wealthy kind of citizens of Israel would bring like gold grapes, gold tendrils, gold leaves to add to the vine. So this just grew bigger and bigger and bigger in the temple. And like, it's like, can you imagine the grandeur of that just here? Like from floor to floor, a pure gold grapevine. And it was there to remind Israel that they were chosen. That they were God's chosen instrument to grow his kingdom. They were God's, um, God, has pr- God had promised them to, um, that they would bear holy fruit, his holy fruit, that they would grow the kingdom, that it would come through them. And although the, Israel's fruit bearing was promised, it wasn't going particularly well. <laughs> um, in Psalm 130, it says that the vine regularly failed to yield the fruit that God expected it would. And in Isaiah, it says that God looked for a crop of good grapes, but Israel yielded only bad grapes. So all to say, for Jesus to say, I am the true vine, can only mean he's saying, I have fulfilled Israel's vine status in me. He is what they've been waiting for. It's in and through him that the good crop will come. So Jesus is reminding his followers, come to me, remain in me, stay with me, spend time with me, because I fulfilled the promise. I am the one true Israelite. I am the vine. It's actually just all about me. The fruit is still promised, but it's not going to grow through perfect observance of the law. It can only be grown in relationship with Jesus. And of course, as I said, we don't have the same connection to Israel's vine status, but the call to remain connected to Jesus remains the same for us. All people who receive Jesus are like grafted into his vine. You have been grafted in. And this means that in the same way, each, for each of us to grow healthily, for each of us to bear fruit for his kingdom, we have to spend time with Jesus. And look, as with everything with the Christian faith, it's easier for me to say that than for any of us to do it. <laughs> um, as an example, this week has actually been a really hard week for me, if I'm being completely honest. Um, One evening this week, I was feeling particularly angry, overwhelmed, confused. Definitely one of those moments of like, what are you doing, Lord? Like, why am I feeling all of this stuff? Like, I mean, I'm kind of smiling and laughing about it now, but it it was a painful day. So Brandon and I go out for a walk in hilly fields after dinner. And of course, I spend the entire walk speaking at him about all of my, like, this is what's going on, and God hasn't done this, and like, you know, just getting it all out, just letting it go. And I am deaf, if you don't know me, I'm definitely that person that just keeps talking, because I prefer to keep talking rather than to actually sit with the fact that maybe I'm in some pain, maybe this isn't really going well for me, maybe I just need to cry. Like, I way prefer just keep the train moving and don't feel it, because then at least I feel in control. Um, So then, of course, I get home, do a couple of numbing activities, watch TV, eat chocolate, the regulars. Um, So basically, my idea is I'm just going to continue to hit the snooze button on all of my emotions, which I'm sure was incredibly fun for Brandon. Um, And then the next morning, it is the morning that we Zoom our friend Caroline to read the Bible. We do it on Mondays and Fridays at 8 a.m. And if I'm honest... I'm still still feeling my emotions. I'm like, the one thing I don't want to be be doing with my morning at 8 a.m. before I've eaten breakfast is reading the Bible with Brandon and Caroline. So I kind of somewhat, without saying it, count myself out. Like, you guys read the passage. I'll be listening. Um, So they both took turns reading the passage out loud. And of course, something starts moving within me. It's just like hearing the truth in these words that they're speaking. It's softening me. Scripture's speaking to me. And actually, primarily, I'm being reminded that God knows me. He's loving. He's kind. I'm being reminded again, oh, 
yeah, I've forgotten who God is amongst all my emotions. Jesus is kind. He's here right now. So after we finished reading the Bible, I lay down on the sofa and closed my eyes. And obviously, thoughts are still pinging pinging around my head. I'm not saying that I have no emotions at this point and it's just been sorted. But I just out loud, thank God, thank you, Lord, that you spoke to me through the Bible through other people because I didn't read it. Um, And will you now fill me with your Holy Spirit? And I just waited, literally just waited for probably like five minutes, complete silence. And after a while, this, fe- this actual physical feeling of heaviness falls on my body. Not in like a, don't want it to sound, not in like a suffocating way, more in like a the perfect weighted blanket kind of way. Um, which is kind of how I've often experienced God's love. And then after a bit more time, a picture kind of flashes into my mind's eye, which is also kind of how I've learned that God speaks to me. Sometimes it's just like an image comes into my head and I'm like, all right, what could this mean? And this picture is of me sitting in this absolutely gigantic white room with nothing else in it. And I'm just like a speck in the middle of the room. But I'm quite clearly upset. Like I'm red in the face. I'm overwhelmed. I'm like hyperventilating in this image in my mind. And I feel alone completely alone and then almost from nowhere this person walks into the room and they just allow me to lean my entire weight back into them and this is hard to describe but as I leant back into this person's arms it's almost like in that moment in my physical experience I felt like I was leaning in someone's arms And as I rested in this person's arms, actually all of the heaviness I'd been carrying just felt way lighter. I could let it all go. The weight wasn't mine to carry. And then I just started speaking out loud, this is how I feel. This is what's going on for me. I felt alone. I'm I'm really scared. You know, just saying out loud, these are my emotions. I'm just gonna list them right now. And actually I felt so much lighter And I tell this story because this is the presence and power of Jesus. Because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And his loving arms are always open. Always. Irrespective of how ugly, crying and angry we are. Always. His arms are always open. And I wanted to tell that specific story because I actually have a sense that there's lots of people either here this morning or watching at home that have been feeling that this week who are in need of an experience of God's closeness to them in whatever they're feeling and through my emotions this week and also through sitting with this passage I've been reminded of a couple of things about remaining with and in Jesus and the first thing is we don't we don't have to remain in Jesus on our own Jesus doesn't say here Make sure that you only spend time with me alone and then the fruit will come. The reality is, I only really felt encouraged to spend time with God after I had remained in Jesus in community. My heart was callous, I guess. And then I got in community, experienced Jesus through other people, and then I went, I'm going to spend some time with him on my own. And of course, this doesn't mean we only spend time with Jesus with other people. There's a reason we have disciplines or there's a reason we pray alone. Like there's, the, there's reasons for these things. But my point is there is always moments in our lives where we are overwhelmed. Something very specific is happening. You know, something very painful is happening. And in these moments when you can't quite bring yourself to be with God on your own, let's do it together. It becomes so much easier. And just FYI, if, no, if you are feeling that and no one immediately comes to mind to do this with, can I encourage you, join a village. There are like midweek, hang out, go to someone's house, I think. Some of them are on Zoom. Some of them are in houses now. Um, but midweek things like get together and be together. Join Jerry's Bible study on Zoom, Tuesday mornings. 
really easy, like get on Zoom, read the Bible. Also, you can totally join our Bible study, which is not an official thing, on Mondays and Fridays. And I'm not even joking, we would honestly love to have you. So if you don't have someone that comes to mind, please do one of the things. Like, you are welcome. We want to invite you. So, firstly, remaining in Jesus doesn't happen on our own. It happens in community. And then my second point is revealed in verse 9. Verse 9 says this, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. And a better or more direct translation of the word remain here is actually to sit down and rest. Sit down and rest in Jesus' love. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now sit down and rest in my love. So if you're up for it, and you at home, um, close your eyes for a moment. Imagine that you're sitting in your favorite place. Mine would probably be some kind of meadow with loads of beautiful countryside around me. Imagine the sun being on your face. The heat is just enough to relax you. And you're completely at ease. This is the beating heart of what Jesus is inviting us into in this passage. Remaining in Jesus isn't about trying hard. It actually isn't about us working out a specific spiritual formula. It's not for people who read their Bible every day or pray every day. Remaining in Jesus is about each one of us learning to sit down and rest in the arms of our Father in heaven who knows us, loves us, hears us with his massive ear. This is what Jesus wants for us. Great, you can open your eyes. I'm realizing that when I wrote that, I didn't realize that probably people would just keep their eyes closed until I told them to open them. Um, But that's what Jesus is inviting us into. And also, I think we can actually take great comfort in knowing that Jesus is saying this to his disciples before his death and resurrection. What do you think the disciples are feeling? They're probably like, remain in me. Remain in you. Dude, you're saying you're going to die. So I literally don't know what you're talking about. How am I going to remain physically with you? Like, this is literally making no sense. They're probably feeling, like, completely mind blown and just like, well, whatever, God. Like, you're going to have to reveal this to us at some other time. Um, But I think we can take great comfort in that because in that moment of confusion, confusion Jesus still declares remain in me so he's not saying it to people that are like yeah cool got it together faith great cool I'm gonna remain in you I've got this he's saying it to some to a group of people that are probably like like how do we do this and thankfully unlike the disciples at this point we actually know that Jesus overcomes the grave we know that remaining in Jesus is in partnership with his Holy Spirit who has taken up residence in us So we know that we no longer have to physically remain with Jesus. We know that's not the aim of the game because he remains. He actually sits down. He actually spends time with us within our hearts. So great. Hopefully we understand a little bit more about how we remain in Jesus. I want to end by asking the question, if we actually do this, if we actually remain in him, if we actually practice spending time with him, What can we be absolutely certain he will do? The first thing, verse one, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. So when we spend time with Jesus, he actually promises us that he will take upon himself all of the crap that we're carrying. He promises to cut off and heal us of basically any and all of the diseased and rotting elements of our lives that we all have. We're all going through stuff. We all carry things. We all 
are consistently like responding to past trauma, past stuff that's happened, comparison and shame, anger and bitterness. I mean, I could list loads of things that come up when, you know, we prod the still open wound. But distance from God, autonomy from him as we try and work through these things that we all have, is actually death to us. Disconnection from our Father in heaven is by very nature of what it is, a subhuman existence. It's not what we're created for. Because this true vine stuff, being part of God's family, remaining in Jesus, it's not an abstract thing. It's like a relationship with a person, a friendship with a person, a closeness to a person. So, my question to you is, do you feel dead or numb with anything right now? Are you carrying anything that just isn't yours to carry anymore? Because come to him. Ask him to take it away. Ask him to fill you with his love, the power of his Holy Spirit. Because he is the only person who can actually, once and for all, with his power, cut off the dead bits of branch that we really don't need anymore. So that's the first thing. If we remain in Jesus, he promises, we know that he will heal, he will heal us. Wow, that's a bit of a tongue twister, apparently. Um, and secondly, back to verse two, let me just remind you what it says. He cuts off every branch of me that bears no fruit, fruit as we just said, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. So Jesus also promises to prune us. And quite frankly, what does that mean? Because I don't know about you, but that makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable. The like sense that God is going to come with his like snip, 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 omnipotent God scissors and snips and stuff. It sounds a bit painful. So if you don't already know, pruning is a critical part of grape growing. Also, I didn't know this. Google. Um, vines, have, vines have to be pruned annually to bear any fruit because basically grapes only grow from vines that are one year old or canes that are one year old. So if pruning doesn't happen, grapes actually don't grow. So it's important that we understand that the word prune here actually means, um, it's more closely translated to purge. It means, I mean, that is the word, purge. The idea that is that as branches of the Lord, we need to be constantly cleansed, constantly like just replenished by his living water, constantly coming into his Holy Spirit time and time and time again. So it's important for us to understand that uh, discarding the diseased and unhealthy branches and then also pruning us to increase the fruit. It's not God being like, I reject you. This is a bad bit. He's not disapproving of us. God's pruning is almost like him saying, invite me in. Let me in. I've got some everlasting love for you. You need to be filled with it again. It's like him saying, I need to remind you of who you are so then you can bear my fruit. So to sum these points up, I want to end with the actual vine and ask you, how do you tell the difference between where a branch begins and ends and where the vine begins and ends. Argue, my point is, I'm going to say you can't tell, but obviously you can disagree with me, but you can't because you're not on stage. You can't tell. <laughs> um, you can't tell where the branch begins and where the vine begins. It's just like, it's there. That's my vine, vine noise. Um, but you can't tell where it begins and ends. It can't be disconnected. It's just like, in it. It's just in. And to bear fruit, the branch doesn't go, oh gosh, I've got to get all the things that I need from the vine to bear some fruit. It just happens. It happens automatically. It's given all the food it's, it needs from the vine automatically. It's not just like, you know. And in the same way, if we remain, if we spend time with God, God provides the fruit for us. This is like literally what he has appointed and chosen us for. We can't actually mess this up, this part, the fruit part, we can't mess up because we don't actually try hard for the fruit because the fruit making is not dependent on us. We just have to remain with him, in him.
We just have to allow him to heal us and prune us and be with him. And the fruit will come. The fruit will always come. So why don't we just stand? And if you feel comfortable to, um, why don't you just open your hands and close your eyes? As Chris said earlier, it's, there's no specialness in this opening of our hands business. It's just a sign of being open to God. And closing your eyes just means you're not distracted. And just in this moment, I'm going to ask and pray that God would meet us by the power of his Holy Spirit. Because that's actually what we need. So Lord, as we wait on you in this moment, I pray that you would come by your power. That you would fill each person here in the room this morning and each person watching at home with the power of your Holy Spirit. Would you fill us from our head to our feet? We just welcome more of you, Lord. Let's just wait for a moment. Let's wait for God. And in your own heart and mind, why don't you invite God to come and meet with you? Why don't you just say, Lord, I just want more, I want more of you. It's your life I need. Just bless what you're doing, Lord. I can see that the Holy Spirit is touching some people in the room. If that's you, you'll know. Just invite more of him. He's just here to fill you again with the love of your Father in heaven. To reveal himself to you. It can feel like a, your eyelids fluttering. It can feel like your body feels a bit shaky. You can feel this need to cry. All of those things are just knee-jerk reactions to God being with you. So just invite more of him. Here at St. Peter's, we always have an opportunity to pray for people at the end of services. It's literally like, come up to the front and there will be someone who's trained to pray that will come and pray with you. And while I was speaking this morning, there was a couple of key things that came to mind, people that I think we really should pray for. So if this relates to you, please do come up and get prayer. Also, any of the prophetic words that were before, please, if that was like, that's me, come and get prayer. Um... But I just felt like there's some people that are just, as I said, are in pain. I feel like God is here to heal you, to, to be with you. So if you feel like you're in particular pain, I would love, love for you to be prayed for. And the other group is, I felt God asked, do you feel fruitless? I just feel like he wants to encourage you that the fruit will come but it can feel discouraging. <laughs> so I think he wants to meet you in that kind of sense of like, what are you doing? Where are you? And the final thing, which actually relates to the healing thing, so I don't know why I didn't say this before, but when we were um, worshipping earlier, I had this picture of Jesus literally being in the room with us and going up to specific people and just asking, where does it hurt? Where does it hurt? both physically or emotionally. I just think Jesus is asking you, where does it hurt? 
and he wants to literally meet you by his healing love and heal what hurts.